the Canadian Bitcoiners podcast is just two guys and maybe a guest or two discussing Bitcoin, Bitcoin equities, and the related macroeconomic space. It's not meant to be financial advice. So please, if you're doing any investing after listening to our program, do your own research, do your own due diligence, and understand that any money you invest can be lost. The show is meant for entertainment purposes only, and we hope you enjoy the program. Friends and enemies, with me tonight for a special dunking on the naysayers. SB, you've been you've been a Coinbase uh, down talker. We'll get to that first. The sponsors, <laughs> he's laughing. First, the sponsors. <laughs> One of them is uh, Easy DNS, the best place for you to host your content. If you got a website you want to put up there, Mark is your guy. Friendly neighborhood domain registrar, and of course. Many other things going on at uh, EasyDNS. You can do all your VPS stuff. So if you want to do virtual private server for your Bitcoin relay, Nostra node, Noldus implementation, BTC pay server, uh, you name it. Uh, Mark helped you with it. He's helped us a lot with our website where we are posting more and more, CanadianBitcoiners.com. And of course, you can get your old email stuff transported over, transferred over, ported over, whatever the word is. Mark helped you with that. They got PGP and GPG email, plus a bunch of stuff to make sure that you're safe over there, including domain share, which we talk about in Access of Easy almost every week now. So if you want to start whatever your it is, the same way we started Canadian Bitcoiners, go to easydns.com, tell them we sent ECBP Media as the code, get half off your first round of purchases, which is really nice. Second sponsor, I got the hat on today, Bull Bitcoin. Great time to be a buyer on Bull Bitcoin. If you want to use e-transfer, you can, easy enough. Sign up with our promo code. I think it's on IWantBitcoin.ca or uh, use the code CBP Media or whatever the link is. It's in the description. But if you don't want to use e-transfer, you want to buy KYC free like Len and I do, like a lot of you do, I can see the volume. Even better. Take it. Take your cash. Go get your fiat dollars, your crappy fiat from Kangaroo Canada Fiat. Walk over to Shoppers Drug Mart. Convince the person that Canada Post that you're not being scammed because <laughs> Bitcoin will show up in the name and uh, give them your money. You can buy KYC free. Goes into your account on Bull Bitcoin. When the Bitcoin gets bought, it's non custodial. You have to provide your address. There is no rug pull possibility. There is no nonsense. And of course, if you really want to, you can even pay your bills uh, with the bills platform on Bull Bitcoin, property tax, cell phone. You go to university still, pay for your bills uh, for your university on bullbitcoin.com. Use our code, IWantBitcoin.ca. They've been a great sponsor. We're looking forward to continuing to work with them. Now, let's get to the main event. First of all, SB, what, how, how are you feeling? Are you like deep into a fifth of whiskey after today's results from Coinbase? Are you feeling like, you know, what, what, what is the mood over there? I, I see the meme. Usually, it's like that's like the hopeful Wojak. I was kind of surprised to see that tonight when you signed on. I was hoping maybe to see like the, the distraught, decrepit Wojak, but here we are. The look, if, if people want to count their fiat gains in some shitcoin seller in Coinbase, by all means, <laughs> they are. They are allowed to do that, their personal choice. No, the, the data point that I did not like, I don't care about the gains. Who cares? I did not like... Bitcoin as a percentage of trading volume did decline quarter over quarter. Not a fan of that. But otherwise, it was pretty good for Coinbase. Okay. let's. Um, maybe we should start. Since Coinbase reported today, we'll start there and then we'll go to MicroStrategy. So quick overview here of the numbers. Let me pull them up. Uh, Coinbase revs, 904 million, uh, much above Wall Street's expectation of 822. We'll talk about the street versus the reality. We were talking about that before the show. It's something everyone should, uh, should consider. Earnings per share, analyst expectations was a loss of a little under a penny. They ended up with an EPS of a dollar and two cents, hundred x the uh, expectation. So, where do you where do you come down? What's important here? What are you looking at in the reporting? You got the Bloomberg terminal there. I'm curious, like, are people who are maybe thinking about the Bitcoin ETF as the proxy, the new proxy for Bitcoin. Are they worried about this, even with the quality reporting, quality output here from Coinbase? Like, what is the story? Where do you, where do you come down? What's the word out there? Yeah, so I actually think it, it is pretty simple. It's just that revenue beat expectations. At the end of the day, that that's what matters. And so for any company on Wall Street, it doesn't matter if it's crypto related or not. You get the big headlines come in, right? You see Walter Bloomberg, big caps. <laughs> the reason that big caps are out there on Twitter is because that's how the big headlines flow in on the terminal, which is where 
ninety percent plus of investors are analyzing this stuff. So four oh eight Eastern time comes in, Coinbase four Q revenue, nine fifty four million estimate, eight twenty six million. So that's massive. Now that's even big for Coinbase, but Coinbase is pretty volatile as a stock in general in terms of where they're going to have revenue and earnings for, versus expectations. So the fact that there's a $125 million revenue B in a quarter, hugely substantial. So big one, that immediately comes out, stock rips up, and it's gone up from there. To your point, you mentioned the EPS. You know, I'm not I'm not as sure how how meaningful EPS is because a lot of times that can be massaged here and there, but yeah, it was a dollar and four cents versus one cent. Great. And then the other big one, we got 4Q trading volume, 154 billion, estimated 143 billion. Now, I've looked back before historically, Wall Street has been getting pretty good at analyzing and predicting what the trading volume is going to be for Coinbase. Um, ahead of the 3Q earnings, looking at what Wall Street had, it was pretty much exactly in line what Coinbase did. So the fact that that was up uh, was pretty substantial. And look, I ultimately think Wall Street was caught off guard by an increase in crypto trading this quarter. I mean, that's at the end of the day, that's the biggest thing that happened to this. So obviously Coinbase stock doing well because of Bitcoin's up, obviously crypto's up, which as, as Maxi's here, you know, we're focused on the Bitcoin, but clearly for Coinbase, they're helped by the crypto. But basically... I, I think we can get into this later, but the valuations d really doesn't matter. It's just Coinbase was was at X price going into earnings. Earnings beat. It's going to go up X percent because the earnings beat. Curious on your thoughts about the recent price action <clears throat> in the Coinbase stock. Obviously, the stock has been ripping the last, I mean, in the last like six months, I want to say it's up 80% or something like that. Something insane. If I pull it up here, you can clearly see there's been some uh, six months, 106%. Uh, it's There's clearly been a lot of as you mentioned, improvement in the ability of investors to predict trading volumes. And so part of me says that you're right. There's definitely something to be said about this thing as a corollary for the Bitcoin price. I, I agree with you there. Is it possible that you're, seeing, that you're going to start to see that disappear? Because when I think about Coinbase's business model now, and you mentioned it with the crypto trading, the Bitcoin price might be the least important metric on their sort of in their reporting now, because most people... If, if I flesh this out, most people who want to buy Coinbase stock or MSTR, which we'll get to in a bit, uh, as a proxy for Bitcoin exposure, don't have to do it anymore. The ETFs are available in the States. When the Bitcoin price is moving, more a lot of people are buying, fine, you get a little bit of a scalp, but I don't think a lot of people buying Bitcoin spot over the ETF are that worried about price, if, if that makes sense. I'd be curious to hear what they think about that. So do you think that there's going to be a move away from this thing as a proxy for Bitcoin and it, you know, vis-a-vis -vis its relationship to the price, like you're not going to see this linkage anymore and people start to care more about other stuff or not. And then second question, sort of a follow-up to that, what role does the ETF custody stuff play in Coinbase's revs? I didn't hear a lot about that on the call today. It doesn't sound like they're convinced it's going to be enough to kind of, you know, keep the ship moving forward. They're talking about other ways to monetize the ETF products. Where do you come down on that stuff? I'll answer the second one first. Yeah, I don't think it's going to be meaningful. Um, so and, and so that's why I've kind of, it's been a very nice headline. And for the industry, yes, yeah, certainly somebody that Coinbase, you know, hate, hate them, love them. We obviously both think that they're focusing too much on crypto as opposed to Bitcoin. But we, we have to give them a hand here. The fact that they are this instrumental in the Bitcoin ETFs is great. It's massive. It's fantastic. It is, you know, hate them or love them. This is a good variable for what they're doing. The problem is, is just that you pointed out how much is this actually contributing to results? It's really not. It's really driven, not even by institutional trading. It's driven by retail buying shit coins. That's, that is where the earnings are coming from. So leading into the first question, Wall Street's forward-looking, or at least they try to be. The, the fiat brains like to think, hey, we want to evaluate this stock 12 to 18 months from now. What does it look like? And you go to 2022. What does Coinbase have? EBITDA, that's your general earnings measure, you know, after uh, before some adjustments, negative 370 million. So 
you're doing negative EBITDA. That's a massive no-no. That's terrible. Coinbase after 2022 came out and was like, hey, going forward in all scenarios, we're at least going to try to have positive EBITDA. And they mm -hmm. did do that in 2023, about $1 billion. A lot of that was stock-based comp. We can get to that, but at least they did it. So I think what investors are saying is, hey, they did $4 billion of EBITDA in uh, the last bull market in terms of annual EBITDA. They did, uh, looking at my, my model right here, end of 2021, $4.1 billion. So right now, if the stock is valued at $45 billion at a $1 billion EBITDA, 45 times multiple, pretty steep. You don't see a ton of those out there. I think even NVIDIA might be less than that <laughs> at this point. If you look at, at a forward-looking EBITDA and not the last 12 months. So that's pretty high, 45. You, you don't find many software companies. This, and you would be thinking of Coinbase as a software company in this particular situation. You wouldn't find many that are that, are that high, especially because after share-based comp, which is sim simplistically Coinbase and other companies do this payout, costs in terms of stock um that was 780 million in uh in 2023 so if you take that out which a lot of people say is a more accurate representation of what the company's actually earning they had about 200 million ebitda mm -hmm. so now 45 billion <laughs> looks crazy but of course investors are saying i don't necessarily think we're going to get to 4 billion in terms of ebitda annually but if the crypto bull market's picking up, there's going to be more transactions, more trading. They already took the take rate up compared to what they had in the previous bull cycle. So, yeah, I'm forward looking. I'll buy, I'll buy Coinbase on the thought that it continues to get more and more revenue. And then just for, you know, earnings in general, it, the, the, the relative earnings are obviously always the most important. But sometimes just looking at earnings, hey, what did it do this quarter? We got transaction revenue plus 64% year over year. So w whenever you're throwing a number like out, like that out there, regardless of if it can collapse one day, Wall Street's going to love a plus 64% revenue growth. So I think all those things go into part of it is just the crypto hype. But part of it is that, yes, earnings are doing better than Wall Street expected. And they have been for a couple quarters now. Underreported story <clears throat> today. Uh, Coinbase had a couple of their executive team members in front of Congress basically begging for the U.S. government to pull up the regulatory ladder behind them in terms of stables and shitcoin trading. I have to look more into that, but I'm curious about how much that plays into something like this, especially an after-hours move of that magnitude. I think we were talking before, it's 13 or 14 points, so I don't know where it is now. But I, I want to um, maybe just ask one more question on Coinbase. What is the what is the likelihood that they do find another way to to monetize the ETF custody thing. I, I don't know enough about this, honestly, SB, to say whether or not there's a way to do this responsibly or a way to do this that's quote unquote like Bitcoin or even crypto friendly. To me, it sounds like the custody take is just a few basis points of whatever they're holding, plus maybe a security slash, you know, cold storage fee every year. I know the inflows have been crazy, but I mean, without that shitcoin revenue, it would have to be completely bananas. Like it would have to become extremely lucrative for it to be a positive in the report. What other ways are there to make money on something like this? Like, do you have any thoughts on that? Any opinions on that? No, I think that's exactly right. At the the revenue they're getting from retail trading just dwarfs everything else. And and actually the the street has been a little bit more negative on Coinbase lately because so much of their revenue, a, high, a much higher percentage has been this interest income, which is not trading, which is the USDC, yeah. which is not, you know, it, that's harder to model. It's harder to predict if interest rates go down, that can, they can be affected by that. So they now have, they now call it out stable coin revenue, but that's, that's not guaranteed. So I think the, the street would rather see the inflection in the transaction revenue. So that's why today you get that massive earnings reaction to wow okay you know if you're the wall street analyst you're saying i totally underestimated the demand this quarter um in terms of retail trading but no i mean look i'm I, you know look at the financials custodial fee revenue 20 million in in 4q23 versus yeah, yeah. versus consumer transaction revenue 493 million. no we we so. should note that q q423 for them ended before the etf started but i don't think I, I mean we've talked about this before i think you and i maybe offline or on the show 
seeding the ETFs. We don't know exactly when that took place, and they didn't mention it today on the call. I don't think it's in the report. I don't think it has to be, but I would expect to see that revenue really tick up next quarter. Uh, given that they've taken in, I don't know, let's say 85% of all the inflows, right? Let's call it three and a half billion. Um, I just don't, I, I, it's just going to dwarf, it's going to be dwarfed by the retail thing. I think no matter how big that number gets, as retail shrinks as a piece of the pie, it's a less attractive business unless they can get that regulatory capture to really kick in, which so far, you know, I've said this before, they haven't been able to do. And and I think another point here too is is companies do love doing this if if they've got a hot growth segment if they've got a good data point to share they'll they'll come out and share it I mean there, there's no reason for them not to especially a company like Coinbase which which pays out so much in share based compensation there's there's no reason why they uh they they would hide something that would be good so I think the the read here is right that. It's not going to be that meaningful to their to their bottom line. Great for the ecosystem, fantastic. Well, most likely we'll see. I don't know if Len maybe disagrees with that, but um, <laughs> we can say we can say that today with him not here. Yeah, let's. We're gonna we'll get to ETF when we finish. Let's move over to MSTR. A uh, quick rundown of their Q4 reporting, which was a few weeks ago now. Total revenues of 124.5 million, a decrease of six percent year over year. Subscription services revenue, <clears throat> $21.5 million, up 23% year over year. And the most important thing here, the Bitcoin holdings, the treasury strategy, they acquired 31,755 Bitcoins since the end of Q3 for $1.25 billion or $39,411 per Bitcoin. As of February 5th, the company held 190,000 Bitcoin, $5.93 billion worth at 31,224 for Bitcoin. The most important stat here, 0.121 Bitcoin per outstanding share of MicroStrategy. Talk to me about this. Yeah. So look, I'll I'll actually I'll I'll think about the software for a second. It was a disappointment, and I actually don't think they had that great of an explanation for it. They had talked earlier in the year about how there there's some enterprises that are may, maybe taking a little bit longer in decision making and are putting off projects. Feasible. Other other cloud software rest companies have talked about that, so that's not something that uh, I necessarily would would disagree with. But yeah, overall we have revenue twenty three. It's four ninety six million versus four ninety nine million in twenty twenty two. In the slideshow in the presentation, twenty twenty four targets growing <laughs> from twenty twenty three. So look, I think really the software the software business does not matter unless you're seeing whiplash moves of five, 10 percent plus. And then there might need to be some discussion of, hey, do we value this company? This do we value the software piece of this company the same way as we used to, given either a significant increase or decrease in the business. So even though that was just one quarter, sometimes these things can be lumpy cloud arrangements, deals can be lumpy, for example. So probably some of that too. So I think software is fine. I do think um, you mentioned the, yeah, you you said per share, the, and the way that I look at it is is I call it the Bitcoin premium. So I'll run I'll run through the numbers here. I've got them at a little bit over two billion of, of net debt, a little bit over twelve billion of market cap. So enterprise value, which is the valuation of if somebody was to offer to buy MicroStrategy today. You have to pay at least the enterprise value because that's the market cap plus net debt, and that's fourteen point three billion. Now, if we take software at a little bit less than a billion, you're looking at maybe thirteen point four billion of total non-software enterprise value, which means mm. Bitcoin value. <clears throat> but their Bitcoin is worth ten billion, so you've got a nice premium here, thirty-six percent. That's a little bit closer to where it was in November, December, when they were issuing equity like crazy. I mean, this was insane. The amount of equity they issued last half of last year when the ETF was close. And I think the the very easy explanation for this was Sailor's here and he's thinking, I don't know if I'm always going to have this Bitcoin premium. It's, it's 40. It's, I think it was kind of more... 40 50 percent range there uh in that time frame and so issued as much as possible as much as could be done and bought i mean bought the most bitcoin they have in years uh yeah. in in 4q 
And then, of course, what did we see, right? We saw ETFs approved, MSTR is not doing so hot. And yeah. that continued for a while. Now we're seeing that reverse again. And so I'm looking at the micro strategy stock movement and I'm going, man, I think they're going to keep issuing equity because the Bitcoin premium is just about right back where it was when they went ham in 4Q23. I have a hard time. I, I mean, I don't know as much about this as you, but just from the, the perspective of a retail investor, I don't think there's anyone in institutional investment firms, even though we know for a fact that I think, uh, is it BlackRock or Vanguard owns a huge chunk of MSTR, right? They bought a, lot, a number of uh, MSTR shares over the last two or three years or two years, I guess, presumably to get Bitcoin exposure. If I look at the landscape now, the first thing I think is, why would anybody pick up MSTR as their Bitcoin proxy? And I do want to talk a bit about maybe this like rebrand <laughs> Bitcoin development company thing, which honestly I think is a little bit bullshit, but whatever, we can talk about that. Why would anyone buy the stock now? And for isn't Sailor, if Wall Street is a confidence game, you talked about forward looking, um, you know, 12 to 18 months out. If it's a confidence game and, and Wall Street is forward looking, isn't Saylor really uh, copying to the fact that he thinks his company is not worth that much? If he's like, I got to keep getting as much Bitcoin as I can because the software enterprise is just not going to be the thing that draws people and especially new capital to my business. Like, this is what I don't get. I, I think that he's kind of, he's he's demonstrated a, a quality strategy, one that I think other people will embrace at some point, especially at now that there's fair value rules in the United States. But the other part of me thinks that it's really only a strategy you can use if you're sort of really cash flow positive, which he's he's just not cash flow positive enough to continue to execute the strategy without basically admitting his business is no good. Do I have that right? I'm trying to flesh that idea out, but I think I'm pretty close. Oh, you, you could even get more aggressive than that. He's com he's completely aware that his software business is not worth that much. I mean, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, no, he um, he knows that. And on the cash flow point, I mean, to, to throw the, the pro coiners over the anti MSTRs people in this in this podcast, um, they did 10 billion, 10 million of free cash flow in 2023. That's barely anything. Now they yeah. were doing more before that, and they're doing things now, like they're paying a little bit more in interest, for example, because 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 some of the debt that they borrowed to buy Bitcoin with. But yeah, that that is not that is not a company that you can do much with in terms of the software business alone. Yeah. Now, the, so the Bitcoin thing, it's, it's very interesting here because I and we've talked about this offline, too. Like we, we predicted that the Bitcoin premium, let's call it 40 percent when he was issuing all this equity in 4Q23, we thought that's going to drop down. Now, we don't know how far it's going to drop after the ETF. It probably shouldn't be zero because MSTR is a little bit levered. Um, I think there, there's probably a sailor premium, which is fair. And the mm. premium is there because there's the idea that Saylor is going to do whatever he can to acquire Bitcoin at advantageous prices compared to where the equity is. So I think that, you know, give 5% for that, give 5% that there's no fees, for example, maybe give a little bit more that you do have the software business in case something goes haywire, and then maybe do a little bit more in terms of historical uh, you know, hey, we, we knew that MSTR freaking went off in 2021 to 1200 a share. So maybe that's worth 15, 20%. I don't know. I mean, it's all a guessing game because it, now it's back up to 36%. So it's a self fulfilling prophecy in the sense that if the market is going to give this guy a 36% premium again, it kind of, it's a kind of unbelievable. It's happening. If they're going to give this guy this, he's going to keep executing the same playbook. And every Bitcoin that he buys with that inflated equity is going to make the whole enterprise uh, 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 worth more. And then the more equity he can issue to get away with this, this high of a premium, the more there should be a sailor premium in the future <laughs> because they've already done all this. So I think it kind of all works together. It is a confidence game to a degree. And now maybe to, to finally put some juice on it, to juice it up even more, um, Look at what look at look at the slide that he added. He added the hypothetical scenarios in which Bitcoin price increases slide. That was new. Yeah. That wasn't in the past one. And he said, okay, so the spot Bitcoin price, 43,000 at the time of the presentation. So we're already uh rocking and rolling here. But base basically he's making the point that 
if you buy a spot ETF and Bitcoin goes to 250,000, you'll make 480% from 43,000. Per their calculations, again, who knows if they're right or not, they say with current leverage, MicroStrategy would get you 660%, so that's a nice gain. And if you add another billion of leverage, you'd get a 740% gain, which looks pretty good versus 480%. So I think that's where the premium comes in. And I, I can stop there, but that jumped out to me as well as what was in what he said on the call as to what they might do in the future. I'm looking at the, the presentation right now. I'm curious about, I mean, if I look at the presentation here, he spends probably 30% of his mic and camera time talking about how MicroStrategy has outperformed Bitcoin you know, the S&P, the Qs, whatever, everything, basically every, all the Meg 7, Oracle, IBM, um, CRM is Salesforce and SAP. I mean, this is a, a slide that's been in his deck a long time. And so you're talking about a slide he's added. That's a hypothetical. I think there's going to be a pretty important real slide that he has to remove pretty soon. And I think it's this one because he, he, even though he's outperforming, you know, the Meg 7, he's no longer going to be outperforming Bitcoin. And I doubt very much that this guy is going to start pu putting in like iBit into his uh, deck, you know, because I don't think he's outperforming iBit. Certainly he's not getting the inflows they're getting. And I wonder how long that lasts. Now, here's a trick question for you. <laughs> Do you know what the MSTR software does? Business analytics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't fucking know. You don't fucking know. I can't name one company that uses it. I think I heard one time, I can't remember where I heard this, but it's like something that a lot of restaurants use maybe. Is that... I don't know. But I, I anyway, I'm curious about this this slide with the hypotheticals because the one thing I don't I shouldn't say I don't understand. The one thing I don't see I, or I don't see an advantage is he is pushing other companies to do the same thing that he's done with Bitcoin and his stock and even his convertible notes, right? Like we've talked about his convertible debt issuance over the years uh, as well with you. And I what I don't see is like where the advantage is if other people start to do this too, and presumably they will, right? I think a lot of people would say that the fair accounting rules was the last hurdle or were the last hurdle for a lot of companies who may want to hold this on their balance sheet and execute some kind of Bitcoin treasury strategy. Do you share that point of view that he's kind of nerfing his advantage by being an evangelist for the strategy or has he got something else up his sleeve and I'm just missing it? No, I, I definitely don't don't agree with that. No, I think the, I think the reason why it worked so well with him there is a bunch of different factors. One of them is definitely the control he has over the company. Now, there are other companies out there that there is voting control, for example. But let, let's call, let's, let's say Zuck or let's say Jack wanted to start sweeping all the free cash flows into Bitcoin, right? If either of them did that, Meta ha has an incredible equity story right now. I mean, they've got... You know, I think what they're worth over a trillion now. They just got yeah. there. They went from 90 to 475. And they've got an incredible, I think, operating income doubled year over year or more um, because of a variety of factors that that went into that. So if you're meta, you know, you're you're doing great. What what would what do you want to do a Bitcoin strategy for when you're worth 1.2 trillion? And when it's not really at this point for a company as big as Meta. It's just going to give you a hassle. You're making 45, 50 billion a year in free cash flow, more than that in earnings. You're not going to put 60 billion a year into, into Bitcoin. And even if you are, the Bitcoin per, per share price, whatever calculation you're going to do, micro strategy is going to be highly, highly, highly more correlated with the Bitcoin price than Meta is because Meta, unless Meta, to, no, see, even, even Meta today, if they put every single dollar of cash, that they have into Bitcoin, they're gonna. It's gonna be more impacted by the business health than mm. Bitcoin. Okay. Uh, one more question on MSTR, then we'll move to the ETF to finish. Do you think MSTR, given that one of the metrics that the S and P five hundred looks at for getting into their index is business valuation, is it possible that as the price of Bitcoin goes up, they get into the sort of spider ETFs or not? I, I did see that kind of floating around. I, I honestly haven't thought that much about it. It would be it would be hilarious. It would be fascinating if they, if that happened. But 
Yeah, in terms of the inclusion or not, I don't know. Yeah, I, I wish I had more in that. Um, but I did want to circle back to um, speaking of things he has in, in the presentation. Um, <laughs> you know, do you notice what stock is not in uh, the, the slide deck? Uh, let lately? me have a look here. He's got Microsoft, Google, Meta, Apple, Netflix, Amazon. There's a big one that's not in there. <laughs> From the Mag 7, that is six, isn't it? What's the seventh? Uh, NVIDIA. NVIDIA's not in there. Yeah, fuck, good NVIDIA's point. That's good. There. That's good. <laughs> so um, I, but, but I, will, I will have <laughs> to disagree with you on, um, at least in the immediate term, since earnings, micro has been much better than Bitcoin. Since Roughly since earnings, micro is up 50% and Bitcoin's up 20%. Which is weird to me because it seems like I mean, I've said this before, but I, I continue to kind of marvel at the way that this is this has happened over the last year. And you're right, since earnings, it's even weirder because the ETF has been available. Who's buying MSTR that's so hyped on the Bitcoin stuff instead of just buying Bitcoin spot or even the ETF? This is the thing I cannot figure out because the answer used to be maybe major hedgies or whatever would, would buy this stuff or family offices would buy MSTR because they like Bitcoin and there was no other vehicle. But now that that excuse is gone, I, who's buying it on that story is what I don't understand. Yeah, I I think that 100% is the right question to ask. I think that is the question because ultimately, at least at, at least at a 20, I would say this at a 20% premium, at least I can sort of buy that from the perspective of what I laid out before. You give a little bit of credit here and there, and you go, all right, you know what? Um, I'm good with that. I think uh, I think it deserves that. What I would have to say then is it's people that want to go out the risk curve. Maybe it's being influenced by options as well. Who knows? But it's people who say, hey, Sailor last call was like, I might do preferred equity. I mean, that was kind of that was kind of out of the blue when he said that in the call. That was strange to me because I don't think he'd ever mentioned that. But he uses that line, says whether it's equity, it's secured debt, it's unsecured debt, it's debt backed by Bitcoin, it's preferred equity, we're going to do whatever is most creative to us. And maybe it is people believing in that. And by people, I, I guess you could say institutions um, potentially affecting the price. And you could say, okay, look back at how did MSTR do in the last bull run? Do I think it's going to outperform? GBTC, I guess now it's not GBTC. Do I think it's going to outperform the ETFs? It is possible. Yeah. It's also going to depend on the entry price. So I, you look today, MSTR is down, I think, 6% today. I mm -hmm. mean, I bet I bet you he sold 100 million of MSTR stock today. Maybe that's too much, <laughs> but it was down 7%. I, I bet you he sold, they, they sold some stock today for sure. We're going to find out. We're going to find out. Uh, let's finish with the spot ETF. Uh, lots of to do and hullabaloo around this. Tons of people mentioning stuff, myself included, about, about the inflows. Four billion in a month took GLD two years to get that four billion. There's something to be said there about currency valuations and inflation, of course. Uh, GBTC selling at a pretty good clip for the first little while, but they've slowed down significantly in the last few days. Uh, and on top of that, you're starting to see whispers now that certain places that offer the ETF are starting to add it to broader ETF portfolios. I think here in Canada, this started about two years ago, where you can get, uh, I think it's, it's like a conservative uh, commodities ETF that includes a 2% allocation to the spot Bitcoin ETF. Not the miners, mm -hmm. not MSTR, the spot Bitcoin ETF, which we've had you know, here um, for about, you know, the better part of two years now, like I mentioned. What, what, do you, what are your thoughts on the ETF? Because I really don't know what to think about it, except that, I, you know, I think we agree on the fact that it's been good for Bitcoin and will continue to be good for Bitcoin. But other than that, I don't really know what to think about this because there's so many vehicles. There's something to be said about, you know, are these guys going to be contributing to the ecosystem in a positive way? Blah, 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 blah. I don't know. Where do, you, where do you come down on this? And maybe more importantly, since you're, you know, connected, bloomy, bloomy boy, uh, <laughs> what's the, what's the mood around these things in, in your circles? So very simple takeaway from the ETFs. They built the rails before the halving. That's it. That's done. Hmm. That's, that's what it is because. I'm sorry, not everybody listens 
to the Canadian Bitcoiners podcast. Okay. Not everybody knows how to buy Bitcoin on an exchange. Hell, not, I mean, come on, storing it. That's a joke. Most, most people, only a very small select percentage of people are going to ever be able to do this. No, no way. So they built rails and now we're going to have the halving. The, the amount of demand this is going to enable simply by having this new transmission vehicle to buy Bitcoin is going to be massive. This on its face, without any halving, without any easing, rate cuts, any of that stuff, yeah. global liquidity increasing again, without, I mean, that we've seen the numbers. The, the demand that we're seeing with these ETFs, somebody can guess what percentage of it would have happened without the ETFs. I'm going pretty low on that. I think most of these people are new buyers. If you already wanted to benefit, if you were already a Bitcoiner and wanted to benefit from the Bitcoin price going up, there were other vehicles for you to do so. GBTC, MSTR, you could go out and you could do some minor minor plays if you wanted to. I mean, there's there is plenty of things for you to do in addition to just buying Bitcoin. ETF changes the entire game. So it, it is just an incredible enabler of people getting into Bitcoin and then when you combine that with all these other factors going on, I mean, that's that's why we're seeing a a rally that some would call disbelief that, you know, Peter Zoltan or whatever the guy's name was said Bitcoin is going to be. I'll tell you what his name's not. I'll tell you what his name's not. It's not Peter Zoltan. Z is the, he's new with it's, the Z. I think it's like Z- Zayon or something, <laughs> Zayhan or whatever. Z-han. I think I'm combining the name with uh, this that, is the Rogan guy, right? You're talking about guy? the Rogan guy. That guy is like Bitcoin's going negative or something. Is that that same <laughs> yeah. guy? Yeah, it's it's 16k and it has 17k more to go. I think <laughs> I think was the quote. So so it's either disbelief or it's just indifference. I mean, and so to to the second part of your question, what is TradFi saying? They're really not saying much because in their mind, Bitcoin's always been this kind of kind of funky thing. And eh, people like to play around with it. It's volatile. You know, I'll, I'll throw in like, you know, I'm in these Bloomberg chats and there'll, there'll be some like 830, 830 data drop. And immediately like the 10 year yield, you know, changes drastically. The NASDAQ changes drastically. And all in and and, and, and into the, the guys that I'm working with, like I'll throw in the Bitcoin price and I'll be like, look, like Bit- Bitcoin's responding. Um, and some people get it, but a lot more people don't, a lot more people don't care, and it's really not on the radar. So no, I, I don't think people really are thinking about it that much. To them, yeah, hey, it's an ETF. There's an ETF for all these different commodities. There's triple levered ETFs in both positive and negative directions. To them, Bitcoin getting an ETF is is kind of it doesn't really matter to them because they weren't paying attention to it anyway. Um, do you think, now do you, that's yeah okay continue yeah. continue no no I mean that's it's crazy but that's kind of the default view I think I I don't get that at all and maybe the the last question I'll ask you I've heard in the last couple of days some people especially this this Fred Kruger guy who came out of nowhere could be a spook I don't know it seems like he's really popular all of a sudden I had never heard anything about this guy two months ago talking about how these major price levels just don't matter as much anymore because there's such a significant part of the Bitcoin demand that's coming from the ETF products and demand for the ETF products comes from people who buy either reflexively or do by reflexively. I mean like think automatic buys through your TFSA for people who are listening or your or Roth IRA or whatever you guys call it over there. And then the other, the other crowd would be people who are saying to their uh, portfolio managers, give me 1%, give me 2%, give me five, 10%, whatever. They don't care what the price is. They don't sell at 50000 They don't wait for dips. They just say, this is the allocation I want, blah, blah, blah. Is there truth to that? Do you think that we're done trading uh, things like big round numbers, uh, things like FTX crashes, there will, which, which there will, of course, be you know one or two more of. I think there's always like a black swan waiting. Or do you think that we're still going to be subject to this? And maybe in that vein, how much, if that's the case that these buys are like price agnostic, is the having going to be a like a 500k bitcoin event <laughs> suddenly if this is the case i mean you know we've 
we've had the conversation about how potentially high it can go. I think uh, no one no one needs to make price predictions here, but. <laughs> Like I was just saying, I think the the ETF in and of itself was just a massive development, and now you you throw the halving on there. No, I I, I think um, I think we'll always be subject to volatility. I mean, right? You look at in the in the early I mean in the early 2010s when I first you know heard a passing word about it, it was like a thousand, then it goes to two hundred, whatever. It's like okay, it doesn't that didn't matter that because it, it could go from 69k to 17k or 16k or 15.5 if that was the lowest point so to me it it really doesn't matter what the overall market cap of this thing is i think it can be extremely volatile and especially i mean like like i said we we built the rails before before the halving i mean when when the halving has typically come in the past what happens you get newbies that want to that want to come in and but then it's like, oh shit, how do I buy Bitcoin? Like, I don't know anything <laughs> about this. And then they go on Coinbase and it's like, oh shit, man, I'm I don't want to buy the thing that's that's 15K. I'm going for that 50 cent shit coin because it could go up to 20,000. So so like you're potentially gonna see diversion from people fucking around with shit coins into just an ETF because they're gonna say, boom, like I can just hit this thing in my stock account. I'm good yeah. to go. I don't I don't need to care. I just buy Bitcoin. Oh, there's no ETFs for for anything else, doesn't matter to me. I just, I just see that big. CNBC's got Bitcoin at 60k, and I'm like, oh damn, that's a big number. So I think some of that could happen. Um, but I think just in general, it's going to be so much easier, so much easier for people to get Bitcoin exposure in 2024 than it ever has been. So why don't we combine that with the fact that if we're right and the price reacts positively to the halving again? Oh my god! Rocketing price, easy to get Bitcoin access. That means more of a rocketing price, and <laughs> we just cycle on up. Oh, and throw throw a rate cut in there too, or throw a fifty bit rate cut in there. So yeah, I mean, look, maybe you know we can listen back at this in three months and be like, these guys were out of their minds. They called the top. This is nuts. But I think anybody following the space, we understand why there's typically uh, a halving rally. You know, I think there's there's sound qualitative and quantitative reasons for why this happens until it doesn't happen. We should probably think it happens. I think that's pretty fair, even though the the, the sample size is small. So ultimately, yeah, I, I think this just juices this. The ETF juices what would be a normal halving cycle that this time is being met with gl global liquidity easing when we've been when we haven't been easing for the past two years. An extremely high quality CBP appearance from USB tonight. Tell people what you're working on. At, at Woke Antidotes on a like <laughs> indefinite semi permanent hiatus. What like are you doing anything else? Do you want to share what you're doing? Do you want to talk about it? Where can people find you? That's true. Yeah. No. I think um, I'll, I'll 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 have something. I'll have something at some point for everybody. Jesus but but, but for but for now, I'm um, I'm just sharing sharing the good good wisdom, the good vibes, the Bitcoin community, which is which has given so much to me. So I have to give back to the community. Outstanding. That's it, everybody. Abbreviated rip tonight, a hard 43 minutes. We'll uh, see you next week on Monday for the usual live stream. Till then, take care of yourselves. Now I got to end this stream. We're still live. We're still live. There we go. Okay.